I'm very excited uh, to have with me here today uh, Michael Wilkinson. Do you, do you prefer Dr. Wilkinson or Professor Wilkinson? Or? Uh, Michael is uh, fine. Michael is yeah. fine. Okay, <laughs> yes. great. Um, uh, in, who is at the Open University? Mm -hmm. um, what's your position there? Uh, well, I'm a uh, professor of applied mathematics. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, my background really is uh, primarily physics, but um, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of physicists work in maths departments in the UK. Hmm. Is that a UK specific thing? Or? Uh, it is rather. I think hmm. that um, uh, in many countries, in European countries, and a lot of uh, US universities, mathematics is, is mathematics. Hmm. It's serious and rigorous. Hmm. Uh, but um, in the UK, there's a rather broader uh, a rather, rather broader view of what qualifies as being mathematics, and uh, you, f you find a lot of physics people working there. Hmm. That's interesting. And how, I guess, one thing I wonder is that, like, my dad is a mathematician and a theoretical mathematician, and so um, I once made a joke to some other former theoretical mathematicians in Biohub that said, and said, Oh, yeah, well, a math conference is happening if there's 100 people there. And we're like, no, a math conference isn't happening if there's 20 people there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is that, is the same true for your field? Is if there's you know, like 20 people, you're already there. Wow, this is so crowded. Like, I can't believe so many people are here. Well, um, sometimes I find the small conferences are most successful. Mm. Um, uh, sometimes uh, if you get a small conference with just 20 people, if you choose the right 20 people, then they interact with each other very well. Um, if you go to large conferences, often it's the, um, uh, you, hear, you hear the big shots giving plenary talks and they're, mm -hmm. um, they're telling you things that you heard uh, often 10 years ago. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I, I myself prefer small conferences and I, um, I prefer, um, well, un conferences dedicated to unusual things. Uh, like what? Um, well, I always try and avoid the popular areas of uh, physics because they're too overcrowded. Um, and I've always been on the lookout for stuff that's um, uh, a little bit quirky and uh, underpopulated, but where there's still some very good problems there. Yeah, that's how, that's how I feel about biology too. Oh yeah, well yeah, it's, there's uh, that, um, bi biology is a... Um, uh, it's a field that still has, um, it, it's still much younger in comparison yeah. terms. And, uh, uh, but it's even more com but yeah. insanely competitive. Uh, it is, but um, on the other hand, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of space available. So um, uh, I think there's, uh, there's plenty of opportunities in biology to find, um, uh, to find something that um, is, uh, oh, no thanks. Uh, the, the shrimp chips are. Yeah. I don't know if you've tried them. They're kind of interesting. It's kind of like shrimp flavored a Kix cereal. Uh -huh. If you ever had that. Like I think I'll try like one or two. Yeah, yes, yeah. please. Go yeah. For it. Actually, just let me take two or three. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Yeah, they're nice and crunchy. Yeah, so I, I don't know um, in biology whether young people have to be seen to do. Uh, to do fashionable things, mm -hmm. but I think there's enough space there that um, you can find things that are maybe not so fashionable, but uh, uh, still have plenty of scope for development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do think in biology there's a lot of pressure to have a, you know, nature cell science paper mm -hmm. during your PhD, so you can get a good postdoc and get a good professorship yeah. and all that. Um, and I guess I see why that is, but I don't really, and I understand that there's people who are very good at playing that game. Oh yeah. But I also don't think that's the game I want to play. Well, that's commendable. For me, yeah. so I, yeah. So I choose to do my own thing, to do something else. And yeah, pursue the quirky things that I think are still mm -hmm. cool and relevant. Um, but I do see a lot of, uh, people and a lot of work going into the like hot fields and they're just so crowded at these these conferences you know and there's like three people presenting essentially the same method mm -hmm. you know and and there's it's good that there's competition there too so you can 
keep iterating on that. But it also, I don't know, for me, I would just feel so defeated mm -hmm. if I was at that conference, one of those three people presenting essentially the same thing as the person before me. Yep, yep. You know, like, I don't want to be like that. I want to be doing something that's, like, really upbeat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, I guess today I had the quote. So every week I do a different Beyonce quote of the day, um, a quote from one of her songs um, for the Byproducts Beyonce channel. And today I chose I'd Rather Be Crazy from her song. Um, uh, shoot, why can't I remember it right now? Um don't look at me, I, I wouldn't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But she says, uh, hold, it's from the song called Hold Up. And she says, uh, would, I, would, you, would I rather be jealous or crazy? And she said, I'd rather be crazy. Mm -hmm. So, and I think for me that resonates because I'd rather have the, like, I'd rather be thought of as weird for doing a strange thing mm -hmm. rather than jealous of other people doing the same method. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I... I get the impression you're reasonably secure at the bar you have so uh, yeah so, so you, yeah. you you have the uh, you have the chance to do that so mm -hmm. that's great yeah mm -hmm. so tell me more how did you get to the bio hub um well uh i um knew greg for a few years we mm -hmm. um uh, we both have a physics background right. and um overlapping interests so maybe i should say um people who are just joining us. So, oh, Greg Hoover. Yeah, Greg yeah. Hoover is one of the um, directs or leader of the theory group here at BioHub. Yeah. And joined, I mean, more than a year ago sometime, more than yeah. that. Um, and so you knew Greg, the leader of the theory group here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so Greg's a very good um, theoretical physicist and mm -hmm. uh, I knew him for uh, several, because of several things that he'd done. Um, and we have collaborated um, successfully in the past. Mm -hmm. And then, That's a good sign. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, Wait, but, I actually have a question for that. What constitutes to you a successful collaboration? Um, well, uh, if a paper comes out and it's a paper that I'm very happy with, then that's a good collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, uh, there have been, uh, I think, three or four thing, things with Greg in the past, mm -hmm. and um, I, I find it comfortable to talk to him, and um, I was pretty pleased with what came out of our collaborations. Yeah. So um, I heard he was coming here, mm -hmm. and um, that uh, seemed like a great opportunity because um, when I originally went to university, I'd uh, uh, been a student enrolled in the molecular biology program mm. and um, I'd been very enthusiastic about the subject uh, but unfortunately I ended up rather unenthusiastic about the program and I left it to do <laughs> physics instead uh -huh. uh, but I'd always had um, a kind of interest in getting back towards doing something in the biological sciences um, I originally entered university to do biology because uh, I thought, um, you know, that's where the cutting, uh, where the big opportunities are in, uh, in science. Physics um, is tough and it's a very mature subject. Um, so I decided to concentrate on biology. And um, I had to make a bit of a, uh, a change of direction. I had a very, su a rather successful career as a physicist, but uh, I'd always wanted to find an opportunity to um, interact more with biologists, and this was a good one. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Great. Oh, hello from, we have a hello from That Your Fan, who has joined us before, so we're just seeing a little bit of, of the, in the chat, who's been who's saying hello. I think hello, we might get some questions later on, too. Great. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to ask, uh, yeah, I mean, if you don't mind explaining more about like what happened in that with the molecular biology program, were they just really mean to you, or um, they had like really absurd requirements, or uh, not really? It was. Um, uh, I think there were two things wrong with it. Um, uh, one was that the program wasn't very challenging. Um, 
And uh, the other was, um, I didn't think they were taking me as seriously as I deserved to be taken. Um, so uh, I, went, I went to a program where I was a lot better qualified than the other students, um, primarily because I didn't want to go to either Oxford or Cambridge. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I, I joined the program at Leeds University, which doesn't have particularly high entrance requirements. Um, and uh, I found the um, uh, I found it wasn't very challenging, and um, I thought the uh, some of the faculty there were kind of underestimating me. Whereas I interacted with some people in the physics department, and I had exactly the opposite experience. Mm -hmm. um, the courses were interesting, and um, they actually took me very seriously indeed in physics. So um, I was uh, very glad to uh, have the opportunity to jump from one program to another. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm glad I, you were able to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. I don't think it was anything wrong with the subject. I think it was. Uh, a problem with that particular that department. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 That your fan. I guess the saying that, or they're saying that the program itself maybe had a problem with physicists. Maybe <laughs> they saw you're a physicist at heart and <laughs> had a problem with you. <laughs> I don't think there's. Uh, I think there's a unity of science, and um, uh, I think I'm a scientist. I um, happen to be reasonably capable at doing quantitative things so I can do physics, but uh, biology was what I really uh, uh, really wanted to have a go at. Yeah. And so you're now at the Open University in the United, in the United Kingdom. Sure. Um, and what's that like? What's that? Because um, before I met you, I had not heard about it. Can you tell me a little bit more about it? Uh, well, it's a, a very special place. Um, so we, um, it was set up in the 1960s. And the, uh, the aim of it was to give uh, opportunities to people who'd missed out on um, the opportunity of higher education when they were at school. Perhaps they, um, uh, they came from the wrong social background, they didn't uh, go to a very stimulating school. Um, perhaps some of them had had to care for relatives who were uh, sick or whatever and couldn't go away to university. Um, so it was set up to give people um, a second chance, and um, it's been uh, a very great, um, a very powerful instrument for uh, social change in Britain. Um, a lot of people who um, had felt uh, a little bit excluded from higher education were able to uh, uh, to have a go. Uh, uh, many of them do get degrees and. Um, Anybody who can get a university degree um, working at home uh, in their spare time while they hold down a full-time job uh, deserves a lot of respect. Oh yeah. Um, so the uh, the level That's of the the level of the courses is actually pretty high. Um, it's uh, the open university degrees are as challenging as uh, those of a typical British university. So it's um, it, it's been a great privilege to uh, be able to spend some time working there. That's great. Yeah. So are you were teaching courses there, or? Uh, so uh, the way it works is, it's essentially correspondence teaching. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, the, the the faculty members write the courses, um, which are available um, essentially as books and. Um, uh, we also produce the exercises that the students have to solve, and then some um, uh, some tutors who are based closer to where the students live, and who are able to meet the students actually grade the exercises. Um, but it, the model is essentially correspondence course education. Mm -hmm. um, there's a little bit of a problem with um, laboratory subjects. Uh, mm -hmm. That's difficult when people can't go to a well-equipped laboratory. Right. Um, but uh, um, uh, on the whole, it does a very good job. So, what, what courses have you um, taught in the past few years? Oh, um, a variety of stuff in uh, applied mathematics. Um, so, uh, uh, the most recent ones I did were courses on um, mathematics for physics and. Uh, um, a course on um, 
deterministic and stochastic dynamical systems, hmm. uh, which has been really successful. And um, so, what kind of systems do you do you um, encounter in that course? Um, well, it's uh, it's rather broadly based, actually. So the deterministic and dynamical and um, stochastic dynamical systems, it starts off with uh, really simple dynamical systems like the logistic map. What's um, that logistic? Oh, what's that? <laughs> oh, uh, it's a simple one-dimensional map. It can represent um, the growth of populations. Um, it's uh, of interest because it's um, a simple system that can show chaotic behavior. Um, and from there, we build up to um, uh, explaining um, stochastic or random dynamical systems like a random walk. And the, um, the uh, later units of the course um, explain things like um, uh, financial mathematics and mm. valuation of derivatives. So uh -huh. uh, it covers quite a lot in rather a, so, a few weeks. So this map, what do you call the logistic map? <laughs> uh, the logistic map, yeah. So, okay, so is that, so we have one dimension here. Yeah. So what's the logistic map? Uh, so here. it's, um, uh, actually, it's been a while since I uh, oh, sorry, went the course, to... but uh, I don't know if we can move uh, our camera a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. Hello, Dr. Javasaurus. Oh, we have a question actually about the Open University. Does yeah? Do the do the degrees in, include doctorates? Um, because he, he, yeah, we um, we do teach uh, doctoral students. Uh, the doctoral students are actually um, uh, mainly based on the campus. So the open mm -hmm. the um, undergraduate students are all studying um, in their own homes. Um, but for uh, PhD students, we're able to um, uh, offer them two options. They can either do um, a full-time course based on the campus, or um, they can do part-time courses where they study at home. Uh, it's very hard doing a PhD off the campus, um, but uh, some people manage to do it. Yeah, yeah. and Dr. Javis was just saying that um, they managed to tutor a master's student remotely, but the, for the thesis subject, it turned into a nightmare. <laughs> it, and, it can, yeah. Yeah, and the, and the research is just the bread and butter for doctoral candidates, so uh, it yeah. can be um, Yeah, so um, uh, it, it, it only really works if you can get together face-to-face -face with the student from time to time, I, I find. Um, so I have had, um, uh, I have had uh, two successful students um, who... Great. Congratulations. Are, uh, who are doing part-time PhDs. Uh, neither of them have finished yet, but they, 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 they will. <laughs> okay, well, <almost> congratulations. <laughs> yeah. uh, but um, uh, but they, um, uh, they, they, they are both able to come and uh, chat uh, from time to time, and that is essential. That, that's where you really, um, uh, you really make progress when you sit down and talk to people. Uh, somehow Skype just isn't uh, isn't quite isn't enough, yeah. enough for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Very cool. Yeah, yeah. It's feasible. I can imagine. I worked from home while writing for a while while writing software. Software. One of the perks. Yeah, one of the perks of working from home or writing software is working from home for sure. <laughs> but I do find that I need to come in like three plus days a week to oh, yeah. really yeah. get that feedback. Yeah. So, yeah, so tell me more about the um, logistical... Okay, well this is, uh, this is just uh, uh, um, very, uh, it's very elementary bit of dynamical systems, but it's been quite a while since I've uh, done anything of it, uh, so I may forget the details. Um, but it's just a, uh, a one-dimensional map. Um, so uh, the next iteration um, is obtained from the previous iteration by a quadratic function like this. Um, so uh, if you um, want to find the next iteration, well, um, from this initial point, you go there. And then um, you'd uh, uh, well, to see what happens next back onto uh, the unit line and then um, you get another iteration 
you project this onto the unit line. And, uh, so, so sorry, wait, what's the relationship between the unit line and the curve here? Uh, the unit line is just um, a way of getting uh, 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 the, the reason for putting the unit line in the construction is just to um, uh, uh, point you to the next iterate. I'm actually making a bit of a mess of this, so okay. maybe, I, uh, <laughs> maybe I should uh, redo it. And, uh... Sure, so, so do, do you define this as, what would this be, um, negative x squared um, So the map is um, <clears throat> uh, xn plus 1 is a function of xn, and the function is just a very simple quadratic function, um, alpha x is 1 minus x. Um, alpha oh, is a parameter. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, uh, an interesting aspect of this, uh, of, of this type of map is that um, even for something as simple as this, it can show uh, a chaotic behavior. You can have um, a random looking sequence of iterates. And um, one way to uh, see how that happens is if you start off with an initial value um, x naught, okay. um, to work out what the next value is, well, you uh, evaluate this function. Um, so the next value is. Uh, not your fan, trying to write <laughs> software, yeah. Is X1? We're all, we're all getting there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if you want to see where the iteration of, where the iterate of X1 is, um, well, uh, you would uh, read off that value on this curve and um, then uh, see uh, where X1 takes you. I see. So you're... And the convenient way of doing that is just to go uh, from uh, this point, x1, to a curve uh, which is a line of unit slope. Um, so you get... Uh, so here's x1. Yeah. So you can produce a sequence of points by um, mm -hmm. going from your starting point to intersect the first curve. Then you go across, and then you go up again and, um, uh, yeah, oops, and then uh, from there you go to there, back again, and um, this type okay. of... Okay, I see how you get chaotic now. Uh, yeah, so um, maps of this type can produce um, a variety of different behaviors, uh, including for some values of alpha, um, chaotic type behavior. Huh. So we teach uh, we teach our students that. Um, uh, um, what is it, what is the definition of chaotic type behavior? Uh, chaotic is um, uh, it really means unpredictable, and there's uh, a technical criterion for what's chaotic. Mm -hmm. um, the technical criterion is that um, if you two take two initial points that are very close together. Um, their separation increases uh, exponentially. Okay. Um, now, uh, there are some other additional criteria to make a, a system chaotic, um, but essentially um, any um, small variation in the initial conditions gets amplified very quickly, so okay. you lose information about where you started very rapidly. Hmm. And um, hmm. yes, it's a, it's a big uh, it, 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 it's a big part of um, uh, uh, modern applied mathematics understanding chaotic systems. Interesting. I just want yeah. to see some of the comments here. Yeah, the software becomes your baby. I worked in cross relation with the EBI, um, European Mathematics Institute, uh -huh. yep. on distributed computing and proteomics. Got my doctorate last August. The Compromonomics group. Woo! Congrats. Wrote a book chapter on mass spec. Based on proteomics throughout the way. All right. Where's I never hear, heard before? The dictionary. Proteomics, compromics, mass spec. Yeah. 
Half Life. Puff Wilkinson do his work. Let Puff Wilkinson do his work. Yeah, proteomics is a protein based counterpart to genomics. Yeah, it's pretty. Proteomics is, I think, way harder than genomics. Because uh, you don't. You're not able to exploit the A to T, G to C base pairing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is fundamental to all genomic measurements. As, mm -hmm. Well, many genomic measurements that are used now. You can't amplify the signal quite as nicely. Mm -hmm. So you have to work with very sparse signal. Yeah. That's a lot harder. So this is interesting. Okay. So this is, and this is an undergraduate course. What About what level is this? Is this like a third year, fourth year? Um, this first is, year? <laughs> uh, this is, um, uh, this is actually a, a final level course. Okay. Um, now, uh, the logistic map would often be in a first year course, but hmm. we, um, uh, we, um, we developed the subject rather, rather rapidly, so uh, this is more or less where we start. I see. And um, we end up with some rather sophisticated stuff towards the end. Hmm. Uh, uh, so, but but um, it, it does, uh, it, it is a, uh, it, it's a terminal level course. That, yeah, that actually, that reminds me of something I was um, looking at today, actually, which was, um, which, here, let me share my screen, actually, and make myself smaller, whoa, okay, um, but, well, my display capture is very interesting, the video capture, nope, you're not open Chrome. There we go. Um, but it was uh, rule thirty. Do you one know of the cellular automata. Yeah. 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 Um, I don't know how much is viewable here. I think it's showing my other monitor. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. Okay. Sorry. I need to configure this. This one's not. That's not the device I want to show. Oop, there we go. It's a little, uh, whoop. It's a little, um, <laughs> what's the term? Recurse? It's like demonstrating recursion. Wow. This is <laughs> yeah. Super excit exciting internals. I think I should have like a better way to switch between these. Okay. Um, but yeah, at uh, so let me put on top. On top, hello. Cool. Um, yeah. But yeah, the cellular automata stuff, I thought was super interesting, um, and move this up a little bit. Because yeah, I, <laughs> I was talking with people today about it, and some of this stuff is. Is quite interesting because okay. yeah you can given any initial value like an initial value in some row mm -hmm. then the next value um, there's some rule for which oh yeah the next yeah. the next value takes on um, and then this can continue and like you were saying with chaotic systems like if some Initial that just reminds me that like the initial condition can change the rest of it quite a bit. Mm -hmm. But yeah. what I think is what's interesting about the point here is that even though the actual shell pattern changes quite a bit, the I guess um, yeah, the, like the theme is retained. Mm -hmm. That's that's yeah. how I'd say it. Is that a real shell? It's quite remarkable. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's pretty interesting, this Rule 30 stuff, or um, the reversible automata. Let me see. I think there was... This is probably from the person's... Yeah, Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. Produced by Stephen Wolfram. Yeah. Very cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's... Because it, these, these patterns, yeah, can look kind of... Um, random 
Well, yeah, I didn't know that. Oh, this, Dr. Javasaur is pointing out that the this uh, cellular automata used for procedural generation of levels in video games. Mm -hmm. That's interesting because I w was recently playing one game called um, Horizon Zero Dawn that was, yeah, also you know, some of the terrain was randomly generated. Mm -hmm. And I thought, like, wow, like how is that possible that they could generate this? But it seemed, but yeah, it's pretty amazing that just with a few rules, mm -hmm. yeah, you can really create everything. Yeah, I didn't realize they used cell cellular automata for those uh, random landscapes. I'd assumed they just used random numbers, but uh, yeah, I but guess Eva would do just as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah I guess, and then it, then it gives it like a little bit more structure, and mm -hmm. then you're not just like a bush, a pond, a bush, a pond, like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of, we're like, we're like, wait, why is there a pond next to a mountain next to a, <laughs> like, why are there just like segments of it to make it a little mm -hmm. bit more continuous? That terrain, the terrain in, I guess in Horizon Zero Dawn is Perlin Noise Base? What does that mean? Perlin Noise? Huh, I've never heard of this. A type of gradient noise. 1985 SIGGRAPH paper. It's classic. So, a type of gradient noise developed by Ken Perlin in 1983 as a result of his frustration with the machine-like look of computer games at the time. Uh -huh. uh, interesting. Yep. So, to make natural appearing textures on uh, computer generated surfaces for motion picture visual effects. Interesting. Wow. So, here's an example of a landscape generated by this Perlin noise. Mm -hmm. It's pretty impressive. It looks, uh, it looks nice, yeah. Yeah, wow. Well, and yeah, all this, yeah, all this technology, amazing technology and web scraping is still a pain. Oh yeah, there's a lot of things that still really suck. Or like a, um, being an expert in both bioinformatics and games, that's good. That's always good. <laughs> You're a witch! <laughs> yeah, bioinformaticians are just magicians. That's really what we are. So, this is so you you go on to do this with financial systems. You said um, yes. That that's where the um, uh, the course ended up. Mm. Um, the last sections of the course were about. Um, uh, explaining the uh, Black Scholes formula for valuing derivatives. Ah, I, what, what's that one? I don't know that one. Um, well, uh, it's uh, to do with um, uh, putting a valuation on a um, on a particular type of uh, financial contract. Mm -hmm. um, so you can um, you can make a promise that you're going to buy an asset or sell an asset in the future at a given a certain price, mm -hmm. and um, uh, the skill is uh, choosing what's an appropriate price uh, right. uh, to uh, make the trade. And um, there's uh, formulae for that that are based upon models for the fluctuation of uh, the value of assets, which mm -hmm. are basically random walks. Um, uh, so um, uh, these formulae are derived from a particular type of uh, diffusion equation. Um, and uh, I couldn't give a uh, I, I couldn't give a quick tutorial on that because <laughs> I've forgotten it. Okay. Uh, but that, that that's where we uh, that's where we end up with our course. Okay. Yeah. So um, is it you and someone else that designed the applied the whole applied math degree, uh, or just you? Or uh, we um, write the courses in collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so um, every course represents. Um, well, roughly a 300-page textbook, mm -hmm. and um, that's a lot of work to do it all by yourself, so yeah. you tend to split it between uh, typically about four people. Oops. Whoa. And um, it, it wasn't me that wrote the bit on the Black Scholes equation. Ah. I just wanted to show this. It's pretty cool. Yeah, so and, uh, we're 50 years old. Yeah. Very cool. Wow. Um, I think on the um, just on the chat, we're just getting some comments about uh, that 
for, I think for this um, random no that noise. Yeah. Perlin noise. It's a technique to ensure random ge number generates numbers are generated without hard leaps. So mm -hmm. it's not like yeah huge jumps. So yeah, I can see how it would make a much more natural yeah. looking surface. There's a, there's other ways of doing it. You can yeah. take um, uh, you you can take white noise and smooth it, and that produces mm. um, things which uh, are pretty good random landscapes as well. Hmm. Um, probably for 1980s era computer games. It may have been a question of what was the efficient way of doing it. Yeah, than, yeah. What's possible. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so does that mean the next number is not being too far from the previous one? Yeah, I think it's the jump's yeah. not so big. And the now that we mention it, my peers call me a buy for magician during my graduation ceremony. That's right. Buy for magician is the is a is a good one that I've heard um, describing buy for magicians. Um, and you can layer. You got those the perlin noise. You can layer it. It is pretty cool, um, and the um, uh, Dr. Dravosaurus is mentioning that he thinks he met you actually <laughs> oh. uh, somewhere during the last six years, but forgot where. Oh, uh, that's interesting. Um, I don't recognize the name, so I can't think where. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if they they, went, uh, that, they go by Dr. Dravosaurus. No, but that's uh, that, that's uh, not a real name, I guess. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And so here we have another question: Does the open University allowed freelance contributions. So I guess if someone wanted to, you know, write a course, um, I don't know if we've ever done that. Um, uh, so one of the things that um, is a little bit difficult is that there's a certain house style, um, and uh, we have had people come from outside to write courses. And um, they tend not to be successful, hmm. um, not because the people are um, not diligent or competent. Uh, it's just there's a particular house style that seems to work for our students. Hmm. And um, well, to be rather honest about it, uh, uh, the open university courses that work, um, uh, they are written in such a way that the, um, the, the really good students read it um, and understand it all, but the, um, the less capable students pass the course by um, uh, seeing lots of examples of what to do. And some of the people that uh, write courses for us um, tend not to put in enough examples or the examples are not easy mm -hmm. enough. So um, we don't actually, uh, um, we, we tend to have the courses written by people who are on the faculty um, simply because that, that's what has worked well in the past. I see. And then when you join the faculty, are you indoctrinated <laughs> with this um, style? Uh, we should have been. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, unfortunately, um, uh, I had to find out the hard way. Um, I arrived there 18 years ago, and um, the uh, the first course that I wrote um, was not so successful uh, because I hadn't actually figured out what the real rules of the game are. Um, so uh, some people, uh, you know, tell you the way they think it works. But the reality of it is that you have to, um, uh, to make a successful course for our university, you have to make it so that um, uh, a student can get through just by, to be honest, following recipes. Uh, the good students don't actually realize that the recipes are hidden in the mm. text and they learn it, um, uh, uh, they, they learn it and come to a very good understanding. Um, but uh, uh, some of the uh, less capable students have to be given a lot of help. Mm -hmm. that, that's just being honest. I mean, I, mean I think that's true of many different um, universities and courses. And I remember when I was an undergrad, it, for me, it was a huge help to have access to my sorority's Bibles, as they were called, oh, yeah. of the versions <laughs> of the previous courses and seeing those yeah, examples exactly. for yeah. like, biochemistry, cell biology. Um, Diffie Q, like it was just so helpful to 
yeah. for me. Maybe I'm the one of those less capable students. I just needed uh, to see a lot um, well, to, to learn it. Yeah, I think there's a lot of things that um, uh, students in a residential university get from me meeting other students. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is that the weaker students um, pick up cues on how to uh, how to survive the courses. Yeah. Um, uh, and even um, even some of the uh, brighter students, like I'm sure you were, uh, find, find ways of just dealing with it all very efficiently. Yeah, well, so I tried. We have we have to work in a bit of extra help into our courses, and that that's why. Um, they work a bit better with people who've written for the Open University in the past. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah so the Dr. Javasaur is saying that it makes perfect sense that you need experienced teaching. And you, you remember, I remember my first year of teaching, it was not easy to modernize the curriculum. I aim for the students to try at least. You, you would not break a computer blasting a sequence. Some of them just needed that small push to get started. Yeah, oh, yeah. I find that too, with, um, especially with, the, um, with coding that I teach. Yeah. Uh, people like I get a lot of people just being afraid to even start or mm -hmm. being overwhelmed that there's so many options and it's unclear where to start mm -hmm. um, and yeah it's it, a big thing I try to instill at the beginning is that not being afraid just trying something like going in a direction mm -hmm. yeah. and seeing where that leads you and if it leads you a good way great if it doesn't you probably still learn something along the way and you can Oh um, yeah, yeah. Go and do something else. Yeah, and um, yeah, it's a it's a tough thing to teach coding because uh, I think people do vary considerably in their innate ability to do it, and you have to find a way mm. of. Uh, I th I don't think it people vary too much in their in ability to do it. I think that there's a lot of um, different ways to introduce the topic, mm -hmm. and I for me. Uh, I remember in um, high, in middle school we had to make a website for our book report. I really loved that and designing it yeah. and making um, different pages for that. Um, but then I, I like, it kind of just ended there because then after that, what was introduced to me for programming was making games, and that was mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. Even though I played them, I didn't think it was fun to make a game. Mm -hmm. um, and that continued on into high school, where the only examples I saw for programming were making games, um, for kids at least. Yeah. And when I went up to college and started doing biology, that's when and I did my first undergrad research. Mm -hmm. That's where I actually saw programming being used to do something what I thought was useful, not just for fun, yeah. not just for something what I thought was kind of dumb, mm -hmm. but translating this like polka dotted glass slide that was had um, this glass slide that was polka dotted with light and dark of where a particular protein was binding and you um, knew exactly what that sequence was because you grew that forest of DNA on your own so you knew exactly which tree it was binding to uh, and transforming that polka dot, all those polka dots into a DNA where it's like, oh, now this binds T-A-T-T-A, -T -T -A. that's so yep. great. So that translation is what then really interested me and got me to mm -hmm. start programming. But I think, like now, I mean, I have the ability now. Like it's oh, yeah. been yeah. years now. But um, I do feel like in many times, the way programming is introduced is in a like, oh, look how cool you could be way mm -hmm. versus look how practical it is. Yeah. And I think that distinction is important because um, I think that, oh, look how cool you can be way throw like pushes a lot of people out because oh, yeah. it comes off as look how cool I am who's teaching you and that can also be really um, off-putting mm -hmm. yeah yeah and um, it can just degenerate into a set of tricks about a particular language yeah, which, uh, yeah, yeah. which don't translate to uh, which won't still be useful when the next um, fashionable language yeah. comes along in five <laughs> exactly. years time yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. I, I want to see. Programming in high school is Alice. I didn't see Alice. Project Discovery is a game. Was oh, yeah. Project Discovery. That's right. That's um, uh, Emma's thing, I think.
Oh, yeah. Citizen Science. Yeah, we have someone at Biohub here who participated in Project Discovery with the... Um, I don't know what it is. Yeah, so Eve is an um, online um, online game. Mm -hmm. Yep. Online multiplayer game. And the... Um, so oh, do I see exoplanet discovery? Yeah, Eve yep. online um, protein atlas. Yeah, yep. so they did um, the protein atlas. They uh, so from um, Emma Lundberg, who was visiting here at CC mm -hmm. Biohub. Um, they worked on a project to um, map cells and proteins using um, crowdsourcing and AI. So they had. Oh, they don't have a nice video here. Um, maybe we can go to this article. I think I might have to log into my special account. Oh no, we can just see it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's the actual paper. I wish they had screenshots from the game. But basically, in the game, they taught people how to. They taught gamers mm -hmm. how to classify if a protein. The kinds of the types of localization of a protein. So there's about mm -hmm. 30 different places that a protein can localize in the cell, mm -hmm. and they had um, gamers classify. So they 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 pull, you know wrote it as like oh on this on this faraway planet we're trying to understand the life on this planet <laughs> and that kind of yeah. thing. So they like played it into the game, mm -hmm. uh, and they actually who coded all of this. I don't know, actually. Yeah, because it, it, it would be... Uh, it probably was it probably was a partnership between EVE Online and the Protein Atlas people, because they had to provide mm -hmm. all the images. Yeah. Um, and I remember in their paper, um, they did a comparison of the gamers versus... Oh, yeah, here they go. So they have all these players. Okay, go away. Um... So all these players who did a uh, training or tutorial and then had to say what kinds of localization, like, oh, was it uh, mostly in the blue part or mostly in the red part? Mm -hmm. um, so this, just to break it down a little, so like this whole red thing with the blue thing in the middle is a cell. The blue part is the nucleus. Mm -hmm. And the green part is the protein that's being sta stained. Yep. And so then you would classify... This protein, you would describe this protein as being localized in um, in one place or another. Mm -hmm. And uh, they then, so they did a training tutorial for the you know, 300,000 people. We then got you know, 59,000 people to actually do the classification. Mm -hmm. um, like how, and they could... Um, but in order to keep them uh, engaged, you have to make them compete with each other, I guess. And... Uh... Uh, yeah, I mean, they were able to the, you would get like money in, in the, in the game. Like, oh, it was part of okay. the reward. You yep. get some, uh, like gain coins, gain money. Yep. Um, yeah, so they, so it was, uh, yeah, going on for about a year and so like images analyzing per day, like they state like, you know, this is above a few thousand images per day. Like mm -hmm. I don't think any lab <laughs> yep. that I know could... <laughs> could analyze over a thousand images a day. That's just a lot. And a one score, so this is a type of um, accuracy score. Yeah. Um, but as, I think this is, let's see, what is D? Say so data quality, took time to stabilize, moving awards for community consensus agreement. So it looks like the gamers, they probably changed some incentives mm -hmm. uh, for the gamers to do a little bit better later on and saw how they did with the known images. But uh, it seems like the the compared to other um, other uh, players, other crowdsourced games, mm -hmm. Project Discovery had a really really high uh, project appeal, so people really liked it, and a lot of people used it. Yeah. Um, compared to uh, like Folded or ETRNA, iWire, these other ones, I've only really seen known of Foden and Eterna. Mm -hmm. Um. Quite close slack. <laughs> it's always messages. Okay. Um, yeah, and they found so yeah, number of players, uh, more than naive, better than naive. Um, yeah, they found that they did get really good uh, classifications mm -hmm. um, from the players 
um, in, in aggregate. So it worked quite well. And yeah, they verified the solutions, as Dr. Jav Sora is saying, uh, they're verifying the solution to ensure solutions were not random and it worked extremely well. Mm -hmm. um, it has a negligible cost compared to having a full dedicated server park. Well, it depends on what the cost of working with the game company is. Yep. <laughs> How difficult that is. Yeah, correcting player bias. Um, I'm not sure. Improved data quality. Too soon to consider each class. I guess the players liked certain shapes. Mm -hmm. So yes, yeah, so they they combined this with. Sorry, I'm trying to find a figure that I remember from her talk, but I don't know if it's in this paper. Okay, I think it's this one. Yeah. I don't know why this says no labels though. Why does this have no axes? Oh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so C is image per class precision versus recall on HP cell atlas. PD corrected. So PD is, I think, the player's consensus. Mm -hmm. Low cat is the uh, neural network. Mm -hmm. um, low cat pink. Drag down by low frequency classes. So yeah, and then, then so gamers plus the low cat um, did even better, though still not as good as the experts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But still quite a bit better than just guessing at random. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. The differences of being the game company already makes a huge income and gets free content by the scientists. That is true. You get free mini games. That is pretty cool. You just have to find like good. It's hard to find good problems to um, apply to. I'm just going to put this on this screen. To um, make into citizen science games. Because I was talking to Emma about this. And um, one thing that I thought was interesting is. like So one the thing there. Um, it's like, how do you make it, 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 it's always about making the problem as simple as possible so that it mm -hmm. can be easily, you could easily say if the person got it right or wrong. Like, yeah. okay, like if, if it's two, uh, two tissues and one of them is cancer and the other is not, like shoot the cancer one or if you're like a first person shooter or something or mm -hmm. pick that one or like kind of, kind of try and work it into the game mechanics themselves or like these microtubules are coming at you. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think that's the hard problem is figuring out how to work the science cleverly mm -hmm. into the game. Because one, because I mean the science, the scientists are the science, the gamers are the gamers. gamers. Yeah. And how to mix them together, well that is what is tricky, I think. It works well when you have uh, something that really has to be done in large quantities. Um, if, yeah. it, if it's uh, just an oddball problem that um, uh, is going to, uh, you know, be resolved in uh, six months, then it's not worth doing something. Yeah, like this. yeah, exactly. So uh, and yeah, if it was I like could... it's like something that saves like ten years of time, which I think yeah. something like this would if you had images mm -hmm. and antibiotics experts. So yeah, Doctor Javasor, sorry, you said games. You're saying games were boring and pointless. Triggered me. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, I want to talk to ask Emma if you could use the system to do de novo sequencing like this. Puzzle peptides onto Spectre, if you will. That, I think, is tricky. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, sorry for saying games are boring and po pointless. I think it's when I was introduced as programming, as the as gaming, making games is the only option <laughs> to apply programming to. I found that frustrating because... Well, I liked play I guess I was hypocritical. I liked playing games, but I didn't want to make them. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't find I didn't find that interesting. I just wanted to play them. I didn't want to put the work into like, making new ones. So I feel like I had a good understanding of random number generators as a result of playing games. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and like resetting the game to get more XP to like replay that battle to see if I got more XP or whatever. Yeah. Um but uh, playing a contrived game cannot really uh, compete with um making a scientific discovery. It's true. Uh, yeah, it's true. I, I mean, being the first person to have understood something uh, is, uh, is a completely different level of uh, satisfaction, I think, than mastering a game. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree. Yeah, puzzle peptides. So, 
Dr. Jeff Swartz, I feel sad I'm not in academia anymore. Um, yeah, just, I understand, just throwing my experience out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have so puzzle peptides onto spectra. Mass spec is crazy. I feel like that would take so much training to understand. Or, like, you'd have to translate that so well. Because, so, mass spec, are you familiar with mass oh, spec? Oh, of course, kind of yeah. Data? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Um, but it's, it's a combinatorial problem. Yeah, uh, so yeah. if I can erase this sure, one. Yeah. Um, one thing that's... I saw a talk about mass spec last week or two weeks ago, so I'm going to try and imitate that speaker and probably butcher most of it. But um, but you get a spectrum like, uh, that is your molecular weight over M over Z. Mm -hmm. uh, molecular weight divided, and the, divided by the charge. Yeah. And... For a particular protein, you'll get in the in the big ones. You'll get this this kind of peak for um, like similar, very very similar charges and like a few isotopes. So like so plus or minus um, some atomic weight. Some um, what are those units called? Uh, Daltons. Atomic, oh, Daltons. Yeah. yeah. Um, because of isotopes. Yeah. But then if your protein is post-translationally modified, so after it's created, then something is attached. So here's your, here's your bare protein, and here's your protein with something else on it. Then you get a, this like characteristic shift here. That's so you get a, something of the same um, shape, same distributional shape, and yet the... Um, I don't know if you can see. Okay, you can kind of see my protein. Um, and but this can happen <laughs> many times. The shift uh, can happen all over the protein, not just in one place. And yeah, I don't even know how I could begin to analyze this. Data. I personally think it's a hard. Like, so the problem is problem. to figure out what the. Um, uh, is it figuring out what the protein is or what the uh, attached object is? I think it's it's a it's a both problem in that yeah. you're trying to figure out what is the original sequence of the protein, given mm -hmm. that there's par all, probably also all these other. I'm just going to draw the distributions, like other distributions, distributional yeah. versions of it. I mean, I mean, I guess ma the, mass spectroscopy can't tell you anything about the sequence. It's uh, it can tell you. Just um, the mass. Uh, it, it can tell you which combination of um, uh, carbon, oh, nitrogen. Oh, combination. I yeah. see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's completely blind about the sequence. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So no, not sequence. Yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Um, yeah. So what the bag of amino acids? Yeah. Is is or 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 like Lego glued together mm -hmm. in this space. But you don't have like the Lego structure, you just have like a bunch of random colors yeah, <laughs> all, all stuck together. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the mathematics of it, though, is um, the mathematics of combinations of known yeah. quantities. And uh, I would imagine that's something that um, computers can be very can be so much better at than, um, than, than people. people. Yeah. So, um, uh, as a candidate for citizen science, I'm not quite sure if that one would mm. would work out. But uh, yeah, I agree. There's, there are lots of others. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. This person saying, "Oh no! If you know a spectrum is built from certain blocks, you can fit them between the significant peaks with an isotope. Modifications are rare. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. that's good to know. And bound to rules in the sequence. Oh, yeah, I'm describing six years of your work very <laughs> poorly. <laughs> <laughs> Doing what I can. It's okay. I don't know proteins that well. Um, cool. So, um, yeah, so I wanted to ask a little bit more about the Open University. So, sure. what does like a week in your life there look like? Uh, well, um, uh, it depends. It it uh, fluctuates a lot. So there's been times when I've um, uh, had to spend a lot of my time um, preparing new courses. And there's also times when uh, the courses are, have been written, they're running, and then um, I'm free to spend uh, time on my own research um, and things like coming here. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, although it's, um, uh, 
it's a little bit difficult writing for people that you never meet. Uh, on the other hand, it does allow a lot of freedom in uh, how I spend my time. Uh, I did work in a conventional university in the past, and um, uh, yeah, of course you have to turn up at particular times and give lectures, and it's uh, very pleasant being liberated from that. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, uh, at the Open University, as long as the work gets done, it doesn't matter um, oh. where you do it or when you do it. Yeah. Interesting. And um, so do you, let me remember my question. So, do you have the same kind of bureaucracy as a normal university? university? Like, you have tenure committees and oh, thesis um, committees and all that? To be honest, much worse. Uh, really? Why? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, if you have... Um, the Open University has um, perhaps 200,000 students. Oh, right. Uh, or yeah. at least it did in the past at various wow. times. Uh, if you have um, an enormous number of students, the, uh, the faculty can't do all of the administration, um, and uh, that means that you do need a lot of uh, uh, professional administrators. And um, of course that has advantages and disadvantages, and uh, uh, you know, I, think the, uh, I, th I think the potential disadvantages are obvious. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. I, 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 yeah, I forgot that yet you're Student base is, you know, Gigantic, an, an order yeah. of magnitude larger than um, really yeah. any other university. Um, so uh, yes, we are. I think we're um, we can be argued to be one of the largest universities in the world. Yeah. yeah. Um, not that many people uh, actually go ahead and finish uh, enough courses to get a degree every year. I've forgotten how many students we we graduate. Um, it's. Uh, a much smaller number, of course, but um, still significant. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if it's you know, like 5 or 10% of, I mean, that, that's the number I've heard for online courses, at least. Yeah. That, you know, 5 to 10% of people actually finish. So even if it's, We, we do best. You know, we do much better than that. Okay, yeah. great. So yeah. let's say, let yeah, let's say it's like 50,000 people a year. That's still a lot. It is, yeah. Right? That's, mm -hmm. that's a huge amount of students that, um, or 20,000, like however many it is, like, that is like one, um, like I grew up in Eugene, Oregon. That's where University of Oregon is. Twenty thousand students total. Oh, lucky you. Like that's one university <laughs> yeah. per year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right from yeah. one university, like that's very impressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And and so, what kinds of problems are you working on now? Um, so yeah. let me let me check if any there's any questions. Um, yeah. Okay. So Dr. Javasaurus said that uh, yes and no humans are far outrange pattern recognition, but a combinatory with a computer would win. In the future, there are profession positions for remote work from home professors. I would apply for sure. <laughs> um, do you work on protein structure, Dr. Javasaurus? <laughs> oh, from fluorine, I want to, I'm just going fluorine boron N2. Yeah, we got some sciencey people mm -hmm. yeah. coming to us. Yeah. yeah. So you came, um, I remember uh, chatting with you when you first came to the Biohub, maybe we can erase this. Actually, yeah. this figure, figure is actually kind of similar to what you were talking about <laughs> before. Um, so, what, yeah, what did you come to Biohub to work on? Yeah, so um, the main thing that I've been interested in is um, uh, some uh, a, a data set on um, single cell uh, mRNA. Um, and uh, this seems like uh, a very nice opportunity because um, uh, the single cell mRNA data tells you what cells are actually doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the genome just tells you what information is potentially there. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's uh, much more interesting seeing what the cell is actually processing. And um, uh, when I heard about this um, uh, tabula muris data set for mice, which mm -hmm. is uh, very extensive. I thought, um, well, I've got to have a look at it and see what uh, one can learn. And um, when I started to play with the files, I found that um, uh, there were some things that looked very striking and um, seemed to be quite interesting. And uh, in particular, what you see is that, um, well, it, it's a set of uh, data um, indicating 
the number of counts of an mRNA for a particular gene in a set of cells. Um, so you typically have uh, about um, 2,000 cells and 20,000 possible genes that might be recognized. Yeah, when we draw that matrix out, yeah, so you yeah. have, yeah, so 2K cells. Yeah. And then um, 20, uh, 20K really genes. Yeah. yeah. 20K genes. Yeah. Okay. And then you and the, um, the really surprising thing about this is that um, uh, if you look at the um, number of reads for a given gene, um, it's incredibly variable. Um, you might find for some genes that uh, most of the cells have no read whatsoever, and then maybe 10% um, of them or 1% of them have hundreds of reads. And um, uh, I um, hadn't been expecting to see that, um, so I was interested in what was behind it. And um, uh, there are two possibilities that come to mind. Um, one is that uh, you have, um, uh, actually if I can just clear this. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, the first possibility is that you have um, uh, lots of different types of cell in the tissue. Um, so if you look at uh, liver cells, um, there might be um, a variety of different uh, cell types, which I'm showing by different, uh, uh, different, square, uh, uh, different shapes. Mm -hmm. And maybe, um, maybe this one expresses gene I, and the squares express gene J. Um, so if you see, um, uh, you know, gene I being expressed in 5% uh, of cells and gene J being expressed in 2%, uh, 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 well, one interpretation is that you have, um, you know, 5% of cells of one particular type, 2% of cells of another type. Mm -hmm. So that would, be, um, that would be one explanation for having... Um, uh, uh, a very heterogeneous uh, uh, set of read data. Um, but there's another possible explanation, um, and that's that uh, if you look at the um, uh, mRNA um, <coughs> presence, um, uh, the count uh, in a given cell uh, as a function of time, um, it might actually be intermittent. It might be something like this. It might uh, have re it, There might be periods when the cell is uh, is transcribing a particular gene, and other periods when it's turned off. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> uh, so the first thing to do is to try and establish uh, which of these two. Um, uh, possibilities as is. And um, uh, it turns out that there's very strong evidence that it's this one. Um, uh, Even for genes that aren't your typical cell cycle genes? Uh, yeah, so there's um, some populations of, well, perhaps 50% or so of the genes, um, you see them being represented in almost all of the cells. Um, and then there's another uh, Fifty percent or so, which are to some extent variable, and go down in some cases to very low um, uh, to very low levels. So you might find some genes which you see in one cell in a thousand, but when you see it, you see a very strong signal. Mm. Um, uh, and the evidence seems to be um, very strongly that uh, it's overwhelmingly a um, time-dependent intermittency. Um, the test for it is to um, look at correlations between um, seeing different genes expressed in the same cell. Um, if it were this picture, you'd see lots of uh, negative correlations because um, gene between I... Between cells or between genes? Uh, between genes. Uh, so you uh, would compute a correlation coefficient between gene I and gene J. And that would be um, the expectation value of the count in 
of D9 times the count of Bj. Um, probably this is disappearing off the edge. Uh, minus the mean values of the counts and uh, divided by the standard yeah, deviations. Yeah, we can still see it. So that's the uh, standard Pearson um, uh, correlation coefficients. Um, now, uh, in this situation, uh, where GNI is never expressed in, some, in the same cell as GJ, um, this term is always zero, um, and that would mean that the correlation coefficients are negative. And uh, the clear signal that favors temporal intermittency is that we see um, very few negative correlation coefficients. There's a few, but um, uh, hmm. not enough to be consistent with this picture. And as far as I can tell, it's completely consistent with the uh, temporal hmm. intermittency picture. Interesting. So, yeah. OK. So, and uh, and um, so let me just so yeah. check some of the questions. So we had, um, uh, yeah, did you work on protein structure? Yes, Mary Minnelli, my colleague and a postdoc were. Um, missed the start of this talk. I help writing software for them. Specialize in link RNA and large-scale reprocessing the data. Yeah, RNA. Dr. Joseph off to drop in on one of your streams. Um, did you experience that postgraduates de-socialize when doing research for years? Um, I guess... Mm, interesting one. That's an interesting question. So yeah. I guess, yeah, I think... I mean, at least I've seen <laughs> for some PhD students, yeah, when they're doing research, and especially if they're doing a project on that is solo on mm -hmm. their own, then yeah, they tend to really be on their own. <laughs> so yeah, yep. someone de-socialized in that way. I don't know if you've experienced that too. Oh, I think that was um, that that was the that was my PhD years. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yes, I um, uh, completely desocialized. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't stream that anymore, though. My experience told me that mRNA only correlates to protein expression within a certain tissue, but not across the genome. Maybe it is similar. That is a proteomic stronghold. Yes, it is hard, but cells run proteins, not genes. I defend enough genomics expert near daily. Dr. Javasaurus, can you find me on the TF Discord? I will try. Let's meet me back on Twitch. I have my wife and my work. Oh, yeah, I did want to point out that I do have a Discord because I'm, like, super cool now, uh, which is one of these um, chat groups. I forget. Oh, no, don't switch. Why do I invite? Ooh, copy. Set link to expire. Copy. Cool, and I can invite people to come chat with me. Then join our Discord. Cool. Um, so we're, we're talking about yeah, the mRNA levels. Yeah, I do think when I was working with people on um, single cell mRNA sequencing, um, mm -hmm. and I still work with people with it, on it, and uh, one of the things that uh, the tissue experts were really taken by surprise and confused by were that was that yeah their favorite protein that worked stained their cells so well mm -hmm. we could just not find it at the mRNA level. Mm -hmm. You know I had to explain to them many times like this is RNA not protein like even if that that cell does have that protein on its surface or inside of it if the aren't like. Just because that's true doesn't mean that the RNA is also there at the same time. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So that decoupling, I think people were a little confused by. Oh yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, with the, I guess I'm I'm interested. So with the Pearson correlations, do you get? Um, I guess with this data, we had where I've typically used a um, ranked correlation coefficient, so uh, like Spearman correlation, mm -hmm. um, which is essentially you rank all the data and then do the Pearson correlation on the ranks. And the, um, the reason that I thought this would, that would be robust for single cell mRNA data is because the counts can vary so widely. Like some genes can be zero and some genes can be 10,000, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. many people do a log scale to deal with that. Other people do um, more uh, like non-Euclidean distance, but like a cosine distance. So a distance between the vectors 
or Pearson correlation. Mm -hmm. um, so do you find, oh, sorry, Spearman. And do you find that this result is robust regardless of which um, correlation metric you use um, or distance metric? Uh, we've not tried um, using any other choice of correlation coefficients on the basis that Correlation this is yeah. um, this is uh, simple to implement, it's simple to understand, and the, um, the verdict it gave was, um, I think, unambiguous. So uh, we didn't push that any further. Mm -hmm. um, but there are some, um, I think there's a lot of uh, interesting things that um, can be thought out about, about correlations that maybe um, have not really been done by other people and which mm. do seem to be accessible with this tabular mirrors data. Um, so uh, I was suggesting that it's, um, it's the intermittency picture mm. and uh, not the uh, cell uh, different variability picture. Um, but uh, if one gene is turning on off like this, um, well, what might the other genes be? Doing. So if this is, um, uh, yeah, gene I guess I, yeah. B A, uh, gene B, and uh, gene C, and as many of them as you want. Yeah, I'm, I'm still not quite clear on what not having many negative correlations yeah. means. Uh -huh, yeah. Means here. Yeah. So do you mind? Oh, um, or maybe showing a few more examples here. Okay. Uh, well, the examples are um, uh, it's numerical studies. Um, okay. So, uh, for example, you can um, compute all of the correlation coefficients. Uh, if this is um, uh, if the indices are genes, you have um, 20, a twenty thousand by twenty thousand matrix. Uh, so in principle, you have a lot of numbers. Um, uh, you, you, you know, it's 100 mil 400 million uh, correlation. Well, it's symmetric, so 200 million co correlation coefficients. Mm -hmm. um, for those numbers, you can uh, you can ask what's the probability distribution. Um, so what we have actually done is to uh, uh, just look at the probability distribution. Uh, so you could look at the probability distribution of um, uh, the correlation coefficient, and then um, this varies on such. Uh, it, it varies over such a large range. Um, it's good to plot the log of it actually. Um, so uh, the um, and you can do this for the uh, positive and the negative correlation coefficients. Mm -hmm. um, the positive correlation coefficients, you see, a more or less um, linear, uh, a linear graph, um, meaning that uh, they decrease exponentially, um, or the, the probability uh, density function is decreasing exponentially. Um, so that's what you get for the positive coefficients. The negative coefficients, you also see a, an exponential increase, mm -hmm. but they are um, very, very much rarer. Uh, mm. So um, uh, there's a very, very strong effect that you see. Um, you see fewer negative correlation coefficients, and especially um, so significant size ones. It's not, well, it's not um, symmetric around zero. Uh, and it's, right? it's not a symmetric distribution. Interesting. Yeah. So, so that's saying that there's not that many genes that are negatively correlated with one another. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a few. Guess, there's a few. I guess. Hmm, I think I'm still I'm still uh, missing something. Mm -hmm. So in. Um, let, let's say if, if this was a symmetric distribution, yeah. what would that um, um, what would that conclude? Uh, I don't know that uh, that would correspond to um, would that be like random 
genes mm -hmm. turning on and off? Uh, if, it were, if it were really a symmetric distribution, um, that would actually perhaps just be nothing more than an indication that you were looking at noise, that yeah. you were looking at rubbish. Okay. Um, because I think that um, uh, uh, I think both pictures uh, give an asymmetric distribution. Um, the uh, picture of uncorrelate of um, cells differentiating into different types uh, that would give a lot of negative correlation coefficients. Um, the other picture, um, well, if things are varying temporally, if the uh, expression is uh, intermittent, um, well then you can make some hypotheses about what, uh, what might be going on. And um, one possibility is that um, uh, there might be um, logical relations between different genes, uh, the activity of different genes. Um, so it could, for example, be um, that uh, uh, gene A might be doing something like this, um, gene B might be um, something where you see it's turn on and off at different times. Um, but then you look at uh, the expression of gene C, and uh, it might be something that's um, only on when both A and B are on. So um, in this case, uh, it, would, uh, it would turn on at this instance of time. And then, okay. uh, and then uh, turn off there. Um, so it would there'd be another period of overlap uh, between those two times. Um, and uh, uh, recently I've been looking deeper into this uh, tabular neuris data set and uh, one can see evidence that um, there are relationships of this type between the activities of genes. You can find uh, uh, cases where a particular gene um, seems to be um, correlated with both, uh, with uh, requiring that both of two other genes are uh, are active at the same time, um, uh, which looks surprising and interesting. Um, if it does turn out to be robust, um, it gives a potential to uh, uh, to, understand, uh, to understand quite a lot of the gene regulation network um, at very little cost. You know, you could just take a, a single cell mRNA. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a data set and uh, deduce something about which genes are switching, yeah. or at least are correlated with others. Yeah, I think a lot of people are interested in using the single cell data to, as multiple, many different experiments mm -hmm. to yeah. then to then learn about regulatory networks. Yeah. I wanted to check about the um, some comments here. I should find that Dr. Javasaurus says I should find the paper on tissue-based expression correlation. Oh, can I make the camera larger? Ugh, I don't know. I have to pull it back. I don't really have a zoom. I just have a laptop. <laughs> yeah. I have to like move things. It's about as far back as we can go. Yeah. Um, does this not suffer from false positive gene activation states? How are you dealing with that? Or is that not an issue at all? Or a gene activation lag? Just thinking out loud. Because maybe there are substates as well, not just zero or one, but triangle signals. So would that be like like this? Um, yeah, and we, um, uh, the data is not of sufficient quality to, um, to be able to see how these, uh, how these uh, genes are turned on or off. Mm. Um, however, um, there are, you can do searches, you, you can uh, uh, assign um, for given cells, um, genes, whether genes are on or off or not, mm -hmm. and then you can find um, overlaps of this type uh, being satisfied with pretty high probability. Hmm. So it's not been um, very high, it's not been very thoroughly um, investigated yet. It's uh, basically something I've 
been working on since I've been here this trip. Mm -hmm. uh, but it does look as if um, uh, as if it might be possible to see. Well, in this case, it's um, information about a threefold correlation between genes, not just a twofold one. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, um, whether it would be um, something that would provide a strong signal for many intermittent genes or just a few that remains to be seen. Um, so I, I have a, f uh, a small number of examples where this appears to work so far, hmm. but it's early days. Yeah, I guess I'm still missing how having um, fewer negative correlations leads to this. So if, if, the, if the data was showing the opposite, that this was mostly negative correlations and and then yeah. a few positive, um, what would that conclusion be there? That most cells uh, have so very few genes on? That yeah. would be consistent with, um, uh, if you see a rare gene on, um, it would be consistent with uh, there not the being other rare genes on at the same time. I'm sorry, can you yeah. say that again? Uh, so uh, if you see uh, an apparently rare or intermittent gene turned on, um, if, there's few, uh, if there's few negative correlation, uh, actually, I'm sorry, which way around did you ask the question? So yeah, I said, <laughs> so if, if this is your yeah. uh, correlation here, zero yeah. and one negative one, yeah. so if you had mostly negative correlations. Yeah, uh, mostly negative correlations would, um, be a consequence of having it's still zero. yeah it's mostly uncorrelated but yeah uh, if you had mostly negative correlations mm -hmm. um, that would be um, a consequence of having uh, um, uh, that would be a consequence of having um, few cells in which two genes were turned on at the same time. Okay. Because if you go back to this expression, um, if you have uh, few cells in which that and that is, um, uh, is uh, if, in which both I and J are present at the same okay. time, then either that number is zero, that number is zero. So the expectation value of the product is zero, mm -hmm. and that means that the correlation coefficient is controlled by the product of the means, and there's a minus sign. So, so it, yeah. it's when you have um, a, a cell, you get negative correlations um, when the genes are not present in the same cell at the same time, mm -hmm. or not active at the same time. So when there's, it's mostly positive correlations, most of your cells are somewhat similar, have like some underlying yeah. gene programs that are shared and not so different from mm. one another. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess I, I'm not clear on how to make the jump from having mostly the same genes on mm -hmm. to the timing, Yeah. to the, to the temporal. Uh, okay, um, yeah, so uh, if you see... Yeah, um, let me erase this yeah. other one. <laughs> uh, yeah. If you see a situation where um, uh, genes are not present in most cells, mm -hmm. um, the two possibilities are um, uh, that there's something that the, the gene is only produced in a certain type of rare cell. Um, that's excluded by looking at this correlation. Oh, I see, I see. And then the only other sensible possibility is that, um, uh, well, the gene is rare because um, it's only been expressed um, intermittently. In time. I see, I see. Because there's also the issue with single cell sequencing that you're capturing so little. Uh, that's, um, yeah, so there's the question of whether it's a technical, a technical issue here. Yeah. Um, now, uh, the uh, Tabby Lemuris uh, data set, um, it actually uses two technologies. There's um, uh, a cell sorting technology and um, also a uh, 
droplets in wells technology. Mm -hmm. um, one of them had um, a lot of markers salted in. Um, uh, so there are 96 mm -hmm. in the cell so source of data. There's 96 artificial genes that have been put in mm -hmm. at known concentration. And you see the signals from those fluctuating, um, but mm. it's nowhere near as large a fluctuation. Uh, as I, see, I see, I see. So use, so use the ERCC spike ins. Yeah. Yeah, to, to, yeah. So, um, to do that. Interesting. Those, and, those vary a lot, but not as much as the. Okay, so, yeah, if you compare that to ERCCs, I don't know if this is still yeah. even visible. Okay, I'm just going to draw it onto one of these. Yeah. <laughs> So if you had ERCCs on here, so they were probably more like this, like... Uh, yes, yeah. Something that was just kind of... Yeah, uh, those can be assumed to be on all the time. Well, cool. sure, yeah. 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 So they, yeah, they're, I guess they're, they're assumed to be constant, but their variation... Uh, you, you see uh, very substantial variations in those. I think they vary by um, uh, a factor of about two or three is typical at yeah. least. So, yeah, yeah, um, they're pretty different. Yeah, uh, but, but the, um, uh, the the recordings from genes can vary by a factor of a hundred or a thousand. So, yeah. 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 It, so does, it, does, uh, it, it does need a biological explanation. You can't uh, you can't say that it's a technical problem with the uh, experiment. Right. Okay. Great. Great. And yeah. And to me. It would be convincing. It's convincing to know that the ERCC is the technical data. Yeah. Um, it's, it's funny because for single cell data, yeah, we mostly consider, and then this, like, when people first starting into doing single cell experiments, like, oh, I need my spike ends, I need to normalize my RNA signal to the spike ends. We're like, really? The ERCCs just tell you if your thing failed or not. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> That's really the main thing. But it's very interesting. I really like this flip use of it. Like, this, this is a, I never would have thought to use the ERCCs as like a true technical spike in, true, true technical mm -hmm. variation to then, I mean, I guess people use that too. Yeah, they look at biological variation. But I guess the first, they use, no, I'm wrong. The first few single cell papers in like 2012, 2013 did use the variation in spike ins and a few other genes to then set some mm -hmm. thresholds for uh, what makes a gene variant enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. Wait, let's see if there's yeah. um, any questions here. Um, cool. You know, it would be crazy if there was enough data to extract a type of interaction score to see how likely a gene or region to, is to be active. You could scan for pseudogenes, pointing, for example, at link RNAs, small open reading frames. That's another assumption all genes correlate to something. But purely biologically, they should. Yeah, a friend of mine um, works on. Um, pseudogenes and protogenes is a cool mm -hmm. phrase too. So pseudogenes, if if pseudogenes are genes that are on their way out, mm -hmm. protogenes are genes that are on their way in. Yeah. So they're shorter genes that um, seem to have, uh, compared to their evolutionary history, have grown larger in length. Mm -hmm. They potentially have more and more functions. So she's very interested in how genes are born. Yeah. Um, and how they acquire new new functions and such. So for that experiment, they did um, a method called um, ribo uh, ribosome profiling. Mm -hmm. So this is after your RNA is um, transcribed and then trafficked to the um, either the endoplasmic reticulum or the mm -hmm. freestanding ribosomes. It's translated, and you can see which by by Pulling out, uh, like with a magnet almost, um, which ribosomes are, um, what ribosomes are currently on an mRNA transcript. Mm -hmm. You can then see which transcripts are actually actively being used to create proteins. And yeah. It turns out that some of these protogenes are actively being used to create protein. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's unclear why. Like maybe it's just that these cells, all they do is follow instructions, and these, you know, yeah. these. This transcript had an instruction, had a start code on and a stop code on, so it looks good to me. Like, I'm going to start yep, translating good. it, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I think that's really interesting. I hadn't really thought about using, um, I guess people who study, probably study or are studying, like, yeah, gene 
formation and such are probably using sequencing data to then to mine for that, to then look mm -hmm. for regions of the sequence. Um, to learn which parts of the sequence are on or off, that's tricky because I think then you would have to take into account the structural um, formation of the DNA and chromatin itself, like which part of DNA has, is so-called open chromatin is available mm -hmm. yeah. to be copied mm -hmm. into RNA and which part of it is closed chromatin that, that you know is closed off, kind of under lock and key mm -hmm. and can't really be actively used. Yeah. Um, at, at the moment because that is that's a 3d structural problem that's not pure sequence space like that's sections of chromosome chromosomes mm -hmm. all over yeah that I think is pretty interesting yeah I think one of the uh, real surprises at least to me about this was the fact that um, uh, the um, well the time scale for these uh, turning on and off processes must be pretty long um, people tell me that uh, mRNA lives for several hours in a cell. Mm -hmm. So the only way you'd see um, a, a signature of uh, uh, mRNA production being um, turned on and off like this intermittently is if the time scale for turning on and off was large compared to that uh, figure of uh, six hours. Mm. Um, so these are apparently very slow processes. Yeah, and, um, interesting. Yes, that is um, uh, something that uh, must have a biological explanation or significance. Um, I mean, the thing that comes to mind for me would be um, cell cycle, because this cycling mm. of cells, or how often cells divide, um, I mean, I'm no bench biologist, so you can't quote yeah. me on this, <laughs> yeah. but it, it, it's on the order of days. Uh, for some cells, For yes. some cells, yeah. 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 I don't know which... There have to be some really rapidly dividing cells to be under a day. Yeah. Um, uh, so, but these time scales, um, I mean, there are some cells which are very long lived. Um, right. I mean, neurons last your whole life, and then there's other long lived cells. Yeah. Uh, but genes are apparently turning on and off, um, maybe by some complicated logical program, uh, maybe, it's, maybe randomly. But it seems they do turn off on and off intermittently, mm -hmm. and the time scale must be slower than the lifetime of the mRNA. Otherwise, the signal would just be smoothed out. Mm. Um, I see. I see. Yeah. Uh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Because then, yeah, let's say like there was a cell division here, like this gene expression. Would, have, would it continue on throughout the division, or um, did it pause, well, or I don't presumably, know? Presumably when cells divide, um, all of the activity that's not associated with the division probably gets uh, shut down. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. I'm thinking of, um, thinking of uh, RNA transcription. Mm -hmm. RNA translation can still occur during cell division. Um, um, yeah, I don't know. You know uh, because don't... it's not at the DNA level, it's just yeah. the RNAs. Because mm -hmm. yeah. you get all the RNA binding proteins, so they can be sequestered along with the RNAs and mm -hmm. whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool, yeah. That's great. Uh, let's see. I found peptide evidence for small open reading frames, so I can confirm that. Well, the pe peptides I can detect feed back into that loop, hours to days. Can detect feedback into that loop. Cool. Hours to days. Yeah, yeah. that's it, that time scale is interesting. Because yeah, I guess cells are pretty. Yeah, trans transcription is a relatively slow process. I mean, compared to I mean, not compared to like mm -hmm. cell development, which takes yeah. you know days and mm -hmm. years. Yeah. But something like um. Um. Like a uh, electric signal, right? Like if you stub your toe or sort of like hammer your finger, you mm -hmm. know right away. That is not that is instant. <laughs> That's yeah. not hours. <laughs> yeah. That you then say, oh wow, I really hurt that. Um, the only thing that happens is like if I get a paper cut and then I like, squeeze a lemon and then I'm like, oh whoa, I didn't know I had a cut there, but that cut happened, you know, a while ago. So it's kind of um, it's interesting to me to think about the different time scales. Yeah. Oh, biology. One thing that really surprised me about um, this interpretation that the transcription is intermittent mm -hmm. 
was that um, when I looked at some books, I saw um, suggestions that uh, uh, transcription factors in bacteria are able to modulate the uh, rate of transcription extremely quickly hmm. in timescales of minutes or seconds. Wow. Um, so uh, it looks as if maybe there might be something fundamentally different about uh, eukaryotic cells. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, when um, one of my molecular bio classes in uh, grad school, we had this one professor that was obsessed with the mediator complex, uh -huh. which is um, the complex containing RNA polymerase, RNA Pol2, and all its friends. It's this enormous, enormous complex. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, perf that actually performs the transcription, and I, um, yeah. So I, I imagine for eukaryotes, I don't know what it, with the same with the machinery is in bacteria. So I can't speak mm -hmm. to that. Yeah. Um, but it may, may be it's some kind of um, in like in one kind of program you have one configuration of the mediator complex, and another program you have a different configuration that's faster or slower or um, stops at a certain point mm -hmm. or, um, you know, gets some earlier signal like, okay, that's enough, we have enough of this RNA, don't need any more, versus in, in some other mm -hmm. setting. Yeah. 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 I think there was, a, there was another professor on that course who was really obsessed with the ribosome, which was always fun, and I think the ribosome crystal structure had just been mm -hmm. solved, and so they were like, wow. It's so beautiful, and to me, it was like, okay, here's like some rotating, like odd figure. <laughs> yep. I don't really know what to make of this, but I'm glad you think it's beautiful. Now I like it, but I think at first I was like, mm, I don't know. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> so yep. People always have their their loves. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I say it depends on a lot. Yeah, gene counts. All of these um, systems depend on a lot. Um, so yeah, we're coming to the end of the stream, but have another, um, officially another 15 minutes left, but we can figure mm -hmm. out what, what more we, um, what more we need. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to share or, or talk about what you're saying oh. at Biohub or? Um, oh, well, I think we've probably, uh, talked rather extensively. Um, uh, there are some results about, um, uh, uh, the characterization of this intermittency, um, which uh, I think are very interesting, but um, uh, may, maybe that's for, an, uh, for another occasion. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but uh, it's certainly proving a very, um, very stimulating place for me to visit. And, yeah. Uh, uh, yes, I'm really glad I made the connection. Yeah, yeah. me too, me too. Yeah. <laughs> and should we be expecting a paper from you soon? Uh, there, um, is a, there is a preprint um, already. And, oh, okay. Um, Can we uh, find it? Uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it, well, okay, there is a, a preprint drafted. Oh, drafted, uh, um, not posted yet. Not, not posted okay, yet. Okay, gotcha. But, um, uh, but I'm hoping that, um, uh, well, towards the end of my stay, this trope pile uh, agreed with my co-authors and, um, and we can get it posted. And, Great. Uh, yeah. That's great. Yeah. yeah, I'll share it once 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 we get it posted. That'll be very very yeah. very very fun. Very yeah. very awesome. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. I'm uh, curious that Dr. Jarvisaurus might have uh, met me. Uh, I I'm wondering. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> At a conference, maybe or. Uh, well, it's uh, it wouldn't have been a biological conference because mm. I haven't been to any yet. But uh, no, it would have to have been a um, it would have have to have been a physics event and uh, uh. yeah. Gotcha. Pro probably, yeah. uh, probably that's not possible. Yeah, I would love to hear more someday. Yeah. <laughs> if you never need software or bio from info related, hit my number. Cool. Yeah. Thank you very much, both of you. Yeah, you're so welcome. I'm so glad you enjoyed well, it. Oh, um, yeah, I'm I glad somebody was interested. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I learned a lot, so it was really good for me. Yeah. Uh, really great for me. Thank you so much, Michael. Well, for thanks. Coming by yeah. And visiting and offering, being so generous with your time and coming and chatting with us. Really appreciate it. Yeah, great. Uh, Thank you so yeah. much. Okay. Um, uh, so you hit the off button now. Yep. Stop streaming. But